Hey there, I'm Mr. Black. And I'm Mr. Green. And we're a couple of guys who met in a comic book store. Together we host the Pint O' Comics podcast, where we invite listeners to join us to talk about movies, TV, comics, music, or just whatever. Starting very soon, we'll be joining up with the fine folks at Forgotten Entertainment, for a special limited series called On the QT, where we talk Tarantino. Every week for 10 weeks, a guest will join us to chat about every Quentin Tarantino movie from Reservoir Dogs to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So join us starting in May 2021. On the QT is available wherever you download your podcasts and is part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ooh, that's a bingo. Hey, I'm Shamar. And I'm Andrew. We're going to be doing a deep dive on all the connected DC animated movies in their cinematic universe. Yes, I'm here to discuss the interconnected storylines and point out how jacked everybody is. And I'm here to share a deep comic book knowledge like Batman having his own sneaker line. So check out yet another DC animated podcast. Part of the Forgotten Entertainment family and coming soon wherever you listen to your podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. Forgotten Cinema is now looking for a new co-host to join myself, Mike Field, because Mike Butler's a bitch. <laughs> Coupe Revenge is coming! This is my town! Oh, no, Which is kind of, I would love you, to do a James Bond podcast. I'll do it right now. Cancel the other podcast. You, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what about all these women? These are all women, beautiful women. Where are the regular women? <laughs> and he gets to Los Angeles. Is this the movie that's going to end the show? It's going to end the podcast? Because <laughs> this movie, like, I cannot, I cannot tell people to watch this movie. Like, I will not. This movie is not good. You get the hell off this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it to the limit one more time. Hi, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast, Season 9, The Season of Summer. Each episode this season, we're highlighting a film that had a coveted summer release date, but for a variety of reasons was forgotten or straight up ignored by audiences. Whether it was because it was pitted against a tentpole film or it was given a limited release run to fill out a studio schedule. We'll discuss what we love about the movie or maybe don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy our podcast, we want to hear from you. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Find us. Our podcast is available on all platforms with a backlog of over 100 episodes for your listening pleasure. Nice. Yeah. I'm a little excited. I mean, I'm a little hyped up. I got this Coca-Cola coffee and it's just a lot of caffeine. So if you looked at our Instagram story 10 weeks ago, you noticed that we're (laughs) drinking coffee Coke while recording. I don't know. I don't know if I like it. I do like it, but it's like, I don't like the after coffee taste. Oh, I really like it. I think that goes together really well. Yeah. I like the Coke. Cinnamon. I think you're trying to make it go together. I think you're trying to make it happen, Butler. No, I like this because I also like uh, the cinnamon co- Coke. It's kind of uh, similar to that. I guess, yeah. I'm not a big... Cherry Coke's good. You like vanilla Coke? Vanilla Coke's great. But oh. I can only have it in the summertime. So actually, probably while I'm editing this in 10 weeks, right. I am probably drinking God forbid Coke. you. God forbid you get ahead of the game, but I understand. One day. One day. One, no, no. No days. No days. I want to get ahead. Just, well, there are ahead. ways you can get ahead, but you refuse to do them, Butler, and that's cancel all your other podcasts and just focus on Forgotten Cinema. <laughs> that's what you should be doing. Damn it. All right. This is law. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we are doing Road to Perdition today, which, you know, what's funny is, is this really forgotten, which I'm sure we're going to get shit for uh, from uh, various people online. But you know what? Yes, it is, because we're going to kind of think we said so, and we're going to figure I out guess. why. I don't know who put this on the list. Uh, you did. It wasn't me. I could see that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, hold on. We can. We why can, don't we get to what it's about, right, and then, then the facts, I and, will then defend you can, my and then choice. you can defend the choice of why it's forgotten. So that, it's a tease, so that we keep people listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't fast forward. So Mike Sullivan is an enforcer for powerful Depression-era Midwestern mobster John Rooney. Rooney's son, Connor, is jealous of the close bond they share. And when Mike's eldest son, Michael, so Mike Jr., witnesses a hit, Connor uses the incident as an excuse to murder Sullivan's wife and youngest son. That's a little inaccurate. Forced to flee, Sullivan and Michael set out on a journey of revenge and self-discovery. He doesn't ex- use his excuse to kill the, the wife. He uses it to try to kill the son. Yeah. And then he, I, and I he think, yeah. yeah, that's that's dumb. That's dumb. You're stupid, IMDb film synopsis. <laughs> Road to Perdition has a runtime of 117 minutes. It's rated R. Production to budget of $80 million. It came out on Friday, July 12th, 2002. Obviously a summer date. Opening weekend was $22 million. Domestic, 104. Worldwide, 181. Clearly a big hit. Mm-hmm. This movie uh, is nominated for several Oscars. 
Uh, was nominated for Best Art Direction, Set Direction, Best Sound Editing, Best Sound, Best Music, which is your score, Best Supporting Actor for Paul Newman. Uh, he lost that year. Uh, I mean, I guess that's OK. We'll get into who he was up against. It actually won Best Cinematography by Conrad Hall. So posthumous, but it did win. So it was recognized by the Academy. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Production company was a Xana company distributed by DreamWorks Pictures in the U.S. And internationally it was distributed by 20th Century Fox. But it was nice to see here that 20th Century Fox logo in front of the movie. I like that. Which we'll never hear again. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it pops up. It just says 20th Century. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's true. It's, it's it'll not, slowly fade away. It's not the same. Sure. It's not the same. Uh, so it came out on July 12th up against a movie that we did, Butler. Do you remember? Dragons. We did a movie with dragons? Oh, Reign of Fire. Reign of Fire. I'm like, did we Dragonheart? Did a movie with dragons. <laughs> <laughs> also, Halloween Resurrection. And of Ugh. course, the ever, <laughs> ever, that's the one in the house, right? Yeah. And the ever popular The Crocodile Hunter Collision Course. <laughs> on the 17th, which is the Wednesday after, you had Eight Legged Freaks, which I kind of like. That's fun. And on the 19th, which is that Friday, you had Stuart Little 2, K19 The Widowmaker, and Tadpole on a literary release. I, wa- I got to watch K19 again because I remember not really liking Get it. Get off my sub. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, he has like a Russian inflected accent in that. Because they all did. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Bigelow. So maybe you might like it again. Yeah, I got to watch it again. I just remember it being really depressing. Maybe it's forgotten. Ooh, you should probably that watch it again if you think it's if it, if it, you think it might be possible that it's for our big list. You probably need to watch it again to see if you like it. I do. Yeah. 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 Uh, so the week before, which was July 3rd, which is obviously uh, July 4th weekend, you had Men in Black 2. Like Mike and the Powerpuff Girls movie, which like the last two, I mean, I guess you're going for the kids, but Men in Black 2 is what probably everyone went to see that weekend. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then everybody was like, what? <laughs> was that the? Yeah, it was OK. It's got a couple. It's got like the story is all over the uh, place. Uh, the, the last two have made two look fantastic. Three's OK. Three's really good. You didn't yeah. like three? Mm, I thought not a not on rewatch. I think three is way better than two. I don't like three on rewatch as much as I did when I watched in the theater. I do not like Men in Black International. No, that, that movie's garbage. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Road to was directed by Sam Mendes, who won an Oscar for directing American Beauty. He was also nominated for the movie 1917, which is awesome. He yep. also did a movie that Butler does not like called Spectre. Yep. And he also did Revolutionary Road, which I love, but I cannot watch more than once. He's also done a movie I love called Skyfall. There you go. So it doesn't make hate- sense how he goes into Spectre. Well, listen, well, Spectre you're, you're is, James Bond snob, Spectre so. is so many degrees below the awesomeness of Skyfall. Spectre is a cash grab for Sam Mendes, clearly. I got to be honest. I've seen them once. I've, I've, I've never seen You've them only seen Skyfall once? I've only seen, I've seen Casino Royale a couple times because I really like that movie. Casino Royale. I've seen movie. Quantum Solace more than once because it's just been on HBO and I've watched it. Right. But I have never seen Skyfall and Spectre really? again. Yeah. I mean, I should. I think you should because I think if you saw Skyfall again, you'd be like, yeah, okay. Okay. I, well, I, when we spin off and do yet another James Bond podcast, which is like my cable. dream, but yes, really, <laughs> I would love you, to do a James Bond I'll, podcast. I'll do it right now. Cancel the other podcast you do. You son of a <laughs> <laughs> I dangle in front of you. Oh, really? James Bond. You want to do it? Get rid of 2PB. <laughs> <laughs> no, about it. At least cracking one open on her own. <laughs> Crack it one open. So, what do you think about this, Elise? I love it, Elise. With, Let's talk about it with Elise and our and our adopted dog, Wicket. <laughs> For those who don't know, Mike has a rat dog. <laughs> Only four days out of the week. <laughs> All right, who cares about our lives? So, screenplay by David Self. I will say, Mike uh, spit up his coffee coke. Uh, uh, he's written The Haunting, 13 Days, and The Wolfman. Does he's actually those are only his other credits, those three movies. Really? Which 13 Days is awesome. So anyways. yeah. This is based on a graphic novel written by Max Allen Collins and Richard Pierce Rayner. Collins uh, he's done a ton of graphic novels. If you're into the graphic novel world, you probably know a lot of the stuff that he's done. Rayner has done I, I honestly I'm not into the world, so I don't know what what what's good, what's not. I, I do have that he wrote Hellblazer number 10 to 16, if that if that's good for him. Hellblazer is the Constantine comic. I know, I know that. that is I know that. Yeah. But I just that's don't, good. I don't want to say, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a, a expert on what these guys have done. Our friends at Pina Comics will have to do like a, like a, friends. hey, if you like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. They should. They could, do, you want to do a compendium to this episode. We're all good with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cinematography by Conrad L. Hall. Like I said, before he passed away, before this movie came out or before this movie got nominated or something like that. Before he, the movie was released. I yeah. Believe. But he has won, he's, <laughs> 
I'm going to give you the, he won an Oscar for American Beauty for cinematography and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The rest of these movies, he was nominated. A Civil Action, Searching for Bobby Fischer, Tequila Sunrise, The Day of the Locust, In Cold Blood, The Professionals, and Morituri. That's ridiculous. Right. So, yeah, he's really good. <laughs> Composed by Thomas Newman. I don't want to go into the Thomas Newman nominated 15 this, times. This has got to be our 20th Thomas uh, Newman I'm movie. Quite, quite honestly, I'm sick and tired of doing Thomas Newman movies. So, like, you know, <laughs> he can just go spit. So, <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> He has done the little things, 1917, the highway. Just go look him up. Uh, so edited by Jill <laughs> Blaycock. She was nominated for an Oscar for editing for Moulin Rouge. She also did Elizabeth and the ever popular Tim Robbins, Meg Ryan, uh, romantic comedy IQ. <laughs> Produced by Sam Mendes, Dean Zanuck, and Richard D. Zanuck. I believe Dean Zanuck is his son or his grandson. Uh, Mendes has produced The Kite Runner, Shrek the Musical, go figure. And he actually <laughs> produced the Penny Dreadful TV show. I did know that. I yeah. did not know that. Uh, Dean Zanuck has done the Zero Theorem and Reign of Fire. Hey, Reign of Fire. And then his father, his grandfather, Richard Zanuck, who passed away in 2012, won an Oscar for producing Driving Miss Daisy. He also produced Deep Impact, but he also produced one of the greatest movies of all time, Jaws. All right. Oh, I didn't know you were looking. I thought you were just like well, when building I, it up. I, it's been over 100 you, episodes You now. point to me usually. I know, but it's been over 100 episodes now. <laughs> you think that we have an unwritten code that when I pause like that, I'm waiting for you for to fill to the say blank. something. You failed. I'm sorry. So Michael Sullivan is played by <laughs> Tom Hanks. There you go. Wait. Oh, he's back. Tyler Holschlin. No, well, it's I, I just told you. It was, I, I said I it wrong on purpose. <laughs> okay, hold on. Anyways, Tom Hanks plays Michael <laughs> Sullivan. Tom Hanks. Now, I didn't know this. I, I, maybe I should have known this. Do you remember what Oscar he won for? The two movies he won Oscars for? Uh, Philadelphia and... I thought I'd trip you up on this. Oh, wow. For those out there, call in. <laughs> Philadelphia's correct. And what was the second movie he won an Oscar for? I'm not going to give you hints because as soon as I give you a hint, you'll know. It's not Castaway. It's not Castaway. He was nominated for Castaway. I can't believe you don't know this. He, these are back to back. He won I know, them back I to know. back. Just tell me. No, I, I want you to get shit. it. I want you to understand. I want you to understand how stupid you are. I want you to understand how dumb you are. <laughs> how dumb you are. Almost how dumb his character was in this movie. Oh, Forrest Gump. <laughs> You're a mom. Dumb. Your how mama oh sure God. does love your education, boy. Okay. So, yeah, Forrest Gump. I don't know why I clapped. I don't I know why I got Philadelphia and I didn't get Forrest Gump. Well, I remember, <laughs> like, we, we've talked about Philadelphia before. He got nominated for Forrest Gump and he never got, he won for Forrest Gump. He never got nominated for Apollo 13. And I love him in Apollo 13. Apollo 13 is yeah. an amazing movie. And he's so, great in it. He got nominated for Big, which I did not re remember. He got nominated, got nominated for, for that? Yeah. He got nominated for Saving Private Ryan, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, and then Castaway. So, but yeah, anyways. Paul Newman as John Rooney. Paul Newman passed away in 2008. Uh, you may know him as uh, a purveyor of fine salsa and marinara sauce. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I actually just bought that today going food shopping. Uh, he won an Oscar for The Color of Money. He was nominated for Nobody's Fool, The Verdict, Absence of Malice. I think this is Rachel Rachel. Is it? It's not Raquel Raquel, right? It's Rachel Rachel. I don't know if you know. I don't know. And then Cool Hand Luke, HUD, The Hustler, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. He was known for all that. I just want to dive into this little tidbit of Paul Newman. So he does The Color of Money. And for those who don't know out there, he's playing the same character he played in The Hustler. Right. So he was nominated for both times he played the same character. Now, I want you to think about. When you watch them, when all these movies that come out or all these like coming to America that came out again. Right. When, and that's, that's probably a bad one to reference because it's more of a comedy. But when you, all these shows that get revivals, the TV shows that get revivals, like the X-Files and Punky Brewster, just to name a few, and all these movies that get, you know, they, they, re, they bring back characters like 30 years later and everyone watches them like, oh, it's good to see the character again. But they never, they're never the same. Never really lives up. Doesn't really, you know what I mean? Right. How amazing is the fact that he plays the same character in a different movie 30 years later from The Hustler and he wins an Oscar for it because he's fantastic. I, I mean, like, <laughs> uh, it's, I, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like the fact that they were able to do his character justice in a second film decades later just goes to show you how it's not as easy as you think it is when you watch all these revivals now that come out. Well, I think a lot of also. Color of Money was probably I have this idea and I want to do this movie. Whereas these reboots and 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 retellings and stuff like that and these, I mean, the reboot is like when you recast, but these revivals are kind of cash grabs half the time. It's sure. just like let's do it. Or Paramount Plus is coming out. Let's 
yeah. find an old Paramount product to like be like, now it's on this show. Let's do Picard. I got you. I mean, Picard's good. <laughs> I, I knew I knew you. I knew you were still <laughs> it. But it, it's true that like, well, Paramount Plus back in our time, like 10 weeks in the past. <laughs> back in when, our time. From when you're listening to this, they are pumping Picard uh, for Paramount Plus true, now. True. But they, they do all that because they want people to come on to their glom onto their thing. Whereas this is 30 years removed. This is a different kind of revival. This is. I have this idea and I just want to do this story. Kind of like the 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 Jake Geddes stories for Yeah. The two Jakes. The two Jakes. It well, as we talked about, it's not very good. But they tried. They did something different and they were go they they went for it. Right. I, I just, you know, I wonder if a lot of people know about the color of money. You think a lot of people listening to us know what we're talking about? No, but then we'll have to do a double episode because I don't think a lot of our audience probably watched the, the original. The Hustler? Yeah. Hustler's awesome. You uh... All right. Anyways, so Tyler, <laughs> Tyler Hecklin plays Michael Sullivan Jr., which is obviously Tom Hanks' son in the movie. He plays and everybody wants some, which is you saw what movie you should see. He's also Superman and Superman and Lois, the new TV series. So I guess the fourth Superman show we got to watch and the movie Palm Springs. Daniel Craig as Connor Rooney. He's in Lara Croft Tomb Raider. Do you remember that? I do remember that. <laughs> yep. In Layer Cake, he's also in Munich, which I love. Jennifer Jason Lee is Annie Sullivan, the wife of Michael Sullivan. She was nominated for an Oscar for The Hateful Eight. She's also in Backdraft and Dolores Claiborne. Sirian Hines is Finn McGovern. What a name. Finn McGovern. <laughs> He's in Circle of Friends, The Miami Vice, I, which I can't remember where in Miami Vice he was in. Do you remember what? He's in my, The Miami Vice, the Michael Mann one, the remake. Not the Finn? Remake, I shouldn't say. Yeah. No, uh, Sirian Hines. His name's Finn McGovern. In the oh, movie. right. No, that's what I mean. Why no, doing? I remember who he is. Okay. I think he's their their chief. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. I think so, yeah. He's also in There Will Be Blood. Dylan Baker as Alexander Rance, who's from the movie Trick or Treat, Happiness, and the TV show Hunters that was on Amazon. He's really good in Trick or Treat. Oh, well, Trick or Treat's really good. Stanley <laughs> Tucci as Frank Nitti. He was nominated for an Oscar for The Lovely Bones. He's also in Big Night, Spotlight, and The Devil Wears Prada. He's in a ton of stuff. He's awesome. He is awesome. Jude Law as McGuire. Uh, he was nominated for an Oscar for The Talented Mr. Ripley and Cold Mountain, which I think we talked about last week. Yep. And he's also in the Sherlock Holmes movies. And then in an uncredited, you didn't see him because the scene was cut and I actually went and watched it because I didn't realize that it was Anthony LaPaglia plays Al Capone. Oh, is it on YouTube? Yes. Oh, I should have watched. Okay. So there's a 20 minute on YouTube. There's a 20 minute, just all the deleted scenes and it's towards the end. And when he's yelling at McGuire, he's, Paul Newman's in the scene, he's yelling at him and, and talking about how come we're keeping your son here. And then McGuire has an idea, and I think it's the idea where they're setting up, they're putting Rance in the hotel, and he's going to just watch them. They, they're going to take all the money out of the bank. Right, like yeah. That. So, so that was, I think that was the idea. So yes, he was. He, I got to watch this. Anthony Apagia is also in Without a Trace, the TV show. He's on Empire Records, but a movie that we did in season four. Was it a five? So I married an axe murder. Was that four or three or two? or I think yeah. it was four. Early it was, Forgotten. It's right before Forgotten Audience Choice. Right. So Butler. Fields. Where do you want to go with this? I don't know. I got a bunch of notes. Do you like the movie? I love the movie. Okay. Did you love the movie <laughs> before you like before like you watched it again? Like, or was it? Did you like the movie even more? Like, is this the same as we did last week with Open Range, where you appreciated it more? I think I liked this a little less this time. Really? Okay. Uh, that, that being said, I I really do like this movie. I just remember when I was younger and I watched this in like 2002. This being one of those those stepping stone movies where like. I really want to do movies. Movies can be everything. This was one of those first movies when I was growing up where I was like, it's got action. It's got excitement. It's got draw. It's, it's, it's amazing. And while I do still think that I think maybe it's a little, I think that there's been other things like this now that maybe not did it, did it better. Oh, we'll go, we'll, we'll go ahead. But what, 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 what are you thinking? I'm thinking some the, the pacing of the movie, some of the, some of the way that it's shot. Um, just kind of i mean the movie moves which is nice but it just doesn't seem to flow as well as i remember and i can't really put my finger on it okay but i just think it, it like when you watch skyfall or when you watch even american beauty which i don't really like it, it flows really the film flows really well you know sam really, on, movie hold, we talk out. about this all the time i'm not a huge american beauty you need, guy. can you watch that again can you watch <laughs> can you just can you just go back and, I, I forget I, it's been 100 episodes so one, one, i forget i feel like you yell at me about it like every well, other episode I, well because i think you need to learn but <laughs> can you go back and watch that and revolutionary road as well which is really depressing but it's a great film it is yeah the the pacing i think really works well or the flow of the film it's not again i can't really put my finger on it and I know this is more of an early, this is right after American Beauty. This is his film right after. This is American the, Beauty. yeah, he wanted to do something that 
was less dialogue heavy because American Beauty is obviously a lot of dialogue, and and the reference to that is also the last twenty minutes of the film. There's six lines of dialogue. Six lines, right? yeah, right. But that's why he wanted he wanted to do something where it was more, you know, right. Yeah. And I feel like this is a little less perfect in its flow. It's it's tough to describe. But well, a lot of the stuff I still really like about the movie. I have one moment in the movie where I felt like it it felt forced in, like something like a scene felt forced in, and right. that was. At the end of the movie with Michael visiting Rooney, uh, when he meets when Paul Newman's characters in the church church and he's like, I just want to talk downstairs. That scene felt like it was put in there to to give them one moment together. The scene in itself works. Right. But it just feels like it's put in there after the fact. It doesn't it feels like it doesn't fit within the movie because the next scene after that is because he basically tells him. You know, I, you know, I'm not going to give up my son. You know, you just, you know, you should have just walked that kind of thing. And and right. basically telling him he chooses Connor over him, even though he knew Connor was stealing. Right. Connor was stealing, set yeah. Michael up. Yeah. Killed Michael's family. Yeah. And he's that, still not going to give. Connor and he up. was still not going to give him up. And I guess he didn't think that Michael would kill him or get to him. He got to him pretty easy. And then because the, the next it's time they see each other, he get he, to him. It's yeah. more he figured hopefully he would back off because I think that he figured he'd be put Rooney figured he'd be putting his son in danger. So Michael would probably hopefully back off. Right. And he didn't. Yeah. I just that scene. While I like that scene, it it, it kind of like you're talking about the flow. I think it kind of it, it kind of made me be like, ah, why is this here? It's a scene chewy scene. It's it, definitely a hey, let's give Paul Newman and Tom Hanks an Oscar moment. Or, or it's a scene where they're just like, we need to have them together one more time. That like it's something like that. It felt that way. It does work story wise because it's an excuse for. It's not an excuse. It's it's Michael's final push to try to get to Rooney to try to get to essentially his father because Rooney is essentially Michael's father as well. And Rooney sees Michael as a son and and be like, you have to choose the son who loves you. Or your flesh and blood son who despises you and goes against your wishes and does whatever he wants and is messing things up for you. And Rooney chooses his own flesh and blood above Michael. So, I mean, that's the final push that Michael really needs to go from, I'm just going to rob and, and do this, to Michael finally going, I'm going to do what needs to be done. Right. Which is Tommy gunning a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that you, did you need another, did you need a scene in there with Connor and John Connor and his father? kind of understand a little bit more why he would choose his flesh and blood over Michael Sullivan. I mean, I get it. You know, you can just, you can have, you can bring your own thought process to that. Well, it's his son. It's, a, you know, he's not going to do exactly. that. But did you need a scene in there for that? Do you think? No, I was, I was okay with the scene that you get when he, when Rooney figures out that Connor has done that. What what do you mean? When like, he, right after the, you know, which is an awesome scene where the, the guy who owes the money opens the letter and it says kill Sullivan oh, and all right. bets are paid. All are paid yeah. And Tom Hanks just, which is really him, not a stunt man, really does whip out the gun and do yep. the two shots. No, he grabs the gun off the desk. Grabs the gun yeah. off the desk yeah, yeah. and does the two shots. It's yeah. awesome. And we cut to Rooney talking to Connor in his room and Connor's like half crying. Like, sorry, I'm sorry, dad. I'm sorry, dad. And Paul Newman like slaps oh, him. And yeah. Starts, and he's like, I cursed the, the day you were born. I cursed the day you were born. Yeah. But then he breaks down and goes, my boy, my poor boy. And like hugs him. You're right. like, so that was good enough for you. That was good enough to me where I got the point where Rooney senior is going to forgive Connor for pretty much anything. Well, he's forgiving Connor for killing his wife. I mean, he kills his wife and son. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you can forgive him for that. And we, we referenced <laughs> the synopsis before how the synopsis is off because Connor goes to the house to kill Annie and he thinks he's killing Michael, the younger but son. But he cannot remember which son is which. Yeah, can you get that sense in the beginning? Who, who are you? Which one are you? Yeah. So he just basically kills his wife and his son and he thinks it's done. And then he doesn't realize that he didn't he didn't kill he he's killed the two wrong kids, son. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> the other thing is like the fact that he does it itself. Like there's no, you don't have this idea where there's no men under Connor who are loyal to Connor. You know, you oh know yeah, they're I mean? all they're all loyal to Rooney Senior because he right. runs the operation well. He treats them well. He's clearly got a sense of honor, right? And Connor clearly has no sense of well, the the, the apology scene, no real sense of honor. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't see what he did wrong. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how to do good business. You know, he almost starts a mob war almost. Basically, well, he starts off the whole movie starts off with a wake because 
uh, it's somebody that was killed by Connor and the brother who is Finn McGovern, basically the brother, they run the bootlegging business. Right. And they think that Finn's brother was stealing Pharaohs. Right. But Connor basically killed him to hide the fact that he was stealing. And then yep. he kills Finn because he's still stealing. And, you know, you get that. So he, he has to apologize. It's like a, a bad known fact that he killed him. You know what right. I mean? And he's got to apologize. He doesn't do it right. And then you, there's two scenes where you understand that Connor hates Michael. And I'm talking about Michael Sr. Right. Is when they're playing piano together and it's a push in on Connor smiling. Right. And he's just like almost breaking his smile, but he's not. And then he has that line to the kid where he's like, you know, because it's so fucking hysterical. Right. And then after he apologizes, which they are, they have Connor in the foreground in the background. You, you see John and Michael Sr. walking away and he's got his arm on, on his shoulder. And it's I like the shot because it focuses on them walking away. It has Connor's face. Shifts Rack focus, focus to, to them. And as they turn the corner, comes back to Connor and he's like upset. Like, it's just like you got that. Like that those two shots right there explain the reason why Connor does the things he does. Yeah, you automatically know without being told that throughout his entire life. Rooney Sr. has favored Michael as his favorite son. Right. And Connor has just kind of been relegated to the background. Right. Which is great. And, you know, I think Daniel Craig does a really good job because the Daniel Craig here is not somebody you could see as James Bond. Well, there's a different, he's playing the James Bond character. Yeah, I got you. But I think that that speaks to his skill as an actor. Oh, yeah. I is, think he's being able to be this kind of like. In, in terms of that kind of idea, like, you know, I mean, he's a movie star now. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't. He doesn't have to get himself into a character anymore. He could just be like a Tom Cruise movie star kind of thing. Right. But he can and he should, you know, Absolutely, out yeah. and stuff like that. And even even um, the Fincher movie, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. He's like, great in that. That's yeah. Also a, that's a, also another fantastic but movie. But I'm saying that he's yeah. playing he's playing an imperfect person. He's not somebody who's, he's not like, you right. know, Daniel which Craig I, playing that which role. Which is interesting because yeah. I think he's probably one of the first James Bonds since maybe Connery who can do that. Uh, step outside the role yeah i mean connery's, connery's always gonna be connery yeah that's the, no i think he's probably he's probably the only one that's done it maybe and, yeah i mean you can make a kiss with timothy dalton but he's only I do like, like dalton yeah but he's only like in three yeah four, three two yeah. he's in two 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 i'm sorry yeah he's got this darkness to him that he plays in all those other roles but yeah but no i, I really like the and what's interesting is remembering the movie one of the things i remembered i had always remembered jude law as connor and i had always remembered daniel craig as jude law's character <laughs> So when they started the movie started, I was like, oh, I switched these dudes up the entire in my memory. I had it completely switched. I remember Daniel Craig being the guy in the house at the very end. I remember Daniel Craig at the diner, but I remember Jude Law in the house at the Jeez. chair. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and you really got that. You know that. So um, the Jude Law character, the McGuire, was uh, not in the graphic novel. They right. made that for the movie. And he's meant to be rodent like. With the long fingernails, because, you know, Michael, the character, the Tom Hanks character, Michael Sullivan Sr. is somebody who's imposing and he's an enforcer and he's he's huge, I guess. Well, that's what he's supposed to be. I know he's meant to be. He's, meant he's to a be. tough guy. That's one of my, I have an issue no, with that's that. fine. I, okay, listen, you can get to that. I'm just we'll explaining to, yeah. to you why he's but voting. The, yeah. But Mendy's wanted uh, somebody, could you, you, you just, you're not going to do another big tough guy to out tough guy the tough guy. You need somebody who is who, who's a wily you know, rat, a weasel. And that's why Jude Law's character looks the way he looks. Oh, man, he's gross. He is gross. He's <laughs> disgusting. I know that Jude Law isn't happy about his hair. Oh, he, I, I don't understand. Like, Where's was he Cap going bald during the movie? Because he's obviously losing his hair, which is fine. We all do that. He's losing his hair, but I think in they, real they, life, he's losing his hair going. I they gave him a bald cap, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's got the part in the middle. So what does he care? They give him like, they, he, it's not his hair. Know, maybe they shaved it down to make it look like that. Eh, whatever. But, um, <laughs> well, tell me why you don't, what, what you don't like about Tom Hanks in terms of his presence. I don't find him imposing at all. And it might be bet that he's Tom Hanks, but I just don't think he's got that. I don't believe the killer inside that you're supposed to see. I guess he's wearing a fake nose in the movie, which I didn't Is he really, really notice. Yeah. I thought he might have been wearing cheek implants at some point. He's but wearing like a prosthetic nose. nose oh, OK. To give, make him look more like a mobster, I guess. But like, I don't really get that. And he's got that the weird mustache. It get works for the time, but it also doesn't. It's not an imposing look. He just kind of looks like he's a little chunkier and yeah. he wears big, heavy coats to make him seem imposing. But we never get a, a good sense of other than that one gun draw that he's an imposing person you should be afraid of. Well, he doesn't he never really physically beats anybody. Right. Yeah. No. So you don't have that. I, we always talk about like sometimes on the show on the show <laughs> on the podcast where roles that character that actors play like you can't picture anyone else in those roles. 
I can picture other people in this role. I mean, right. I love Tom Hanks. Which is, I think yeah, he, I think he's, he's the he's, only Tom Hanks role where you're going to yeah, say that. He's really good in this movie, but I can picture other people in this film and not maybe doing it better. Just I can picture other people doing it. But I think you you really want to see that the enforcer be the enforcer. You know what I mean? Not yeah. just Tommy gunning two people where your son's watching underneath and you don't really see anything. And I know that Hanks and uh, Conrad Hall asked Mendes to take out a lot of the violence in the movie. I saw that. Which, I mean, I, I gotta, I gotta disagree with that decision. It's already rated R, and, and this is the type of movie it is. It is. I mean, I think you could have, I think you could have kept some of it in there. I think that, yeah, the violence would have helped sell me on the enforcer. It's the thing is, hey, you get the headshot at the beginning when they shoot Finn. Right. It's completely unrealistic because there's no blood. You see it. There's no blood. No there's spurt. just smoke from his yeah. end, Connor's end of the gun, and I, I immediately took me out of that scene. Yeah. And took me out of the violence that Michael sees. Yep. Michael Jr. And one of the things we talk about in one of our first episodes for Collateral is turning Tom Cruise into a villain. Right. And turning him, making you believe he's this tough guy is he sees this. You see him do all this violent stuff and it's actually him on screen performing these actions. Yeah. And I think even more so than Cruise, Tom Hanks, the most likable guy in America, needs that to be seen at the beginning of the movie. Needs you... You need to see him transform into this person so you no longer see him yeah. as Tom Hanks. And I don't think he's given that chance at the beginning. Well, I, you know, when, yeah, I, I, I agree. And like, I, I, I do like this movie. I don't think I like it as much. I think I, I, I'm not that, I, I mean, we're talking like, we're talking like a minuscule amount, you know, like I really loved the last movie, the last week, open range. I Both was times, really like impressed. The second yeah. Time. The second time around here, I feel like this is very much a safe gangster film in terms mm -hmm. of the violence. The archetypes and the story elements are reminiscent of a lot of stuff. I know this is loosely. The graphic novel was an homage to the manga series Lone Wolf and Cub. And this movie is not a re remake of that, but that's what the It just takes the basic is. premise. Right. right. But it's but let's be Which honest. Guy this protecting this, his kid from this premise. Yeah, this premise is not new to, to even Lone Wolf and Cubs. This premise is, has been around. So yes. uh, I just. I, I I really think like could you imagine let, let me uh, let's put it this way can you imagine <laughs> this movie Road to Perdition directed by Tarantino now that's a movie that I'd be very interested in seeing yeah you know what I mean like because I think there'd be a lot of really nice stuff in that movie I and mean, there's a lot of there, I am not crapping on this movie I like this movie quite a bit it's a great movie I, like yeah. I said I just feel like it's a little bit of a safe gangster film it absolutely is I think I mean Quentin Tarantino if you had it, it the level of violence would be extreme, but I think that works as long as Quentin Tarantino could get the father son element right. Sure. Because that's one thing that really works in the film is when they're on the run, the few scenes, and you don't get a lot of them because it takes you over an hour to the movie to get to them on the run, which I think takes too much time. You get this, you get this good, a few really good father son moments between the two of them, especially when they're in the farmhouse and Michael Jr. just straight up asks them, Did you like Peter better? Yes. And that's a very nice moment. And that's where Tom Hanks shines. Yeah. Um, obviously, that's we love Tom Hanks and we like to see him with his kid and stuff like that and be a good father. Could Quentin Tarantino do a scene like that? I don't know. I think so. I but, so. But but I mean, it's, a, it's listen, that's a different movie we're asking right. for. It's a completely different. But I agree film. that you need that level of violence to right. juxtapose this world that Michael lives in and the family that he's trying to build. And you don't get right. that. And to your point, the quote unquote road to perdition is actually, like you said, starts in an hour into the film. And then it's just like, uh, and then they kind of get off of it. And it's so it's, it's a little it's I get the title, but mm, that's not really what it's about. You know what I mean, I mean? That's the theme. It's the road to damnation that they're all on. But not Michael Jr. He's the one person. Well, but he's the lead. They say that in the. Uh, but he's in, the lead. In the church. He's, he's a, I mean, I don't like the voiceover. In the I was going to ask you, do you like. The, no. Would you like the voiceover better if it was older, Michael? I know that that that's the way it is in the graphic novel. It, that's well, how it is. He's a and he's a priest. Oh, is he a priest? Yeah, he's a priest later on. But clearly he's older because he goes, and that's why I never held a yeah. gun again in my no. life. Well, you're like yeah. uh, what a month older than you were yeah. when you said that. Well, he's got a line where he's like. A lot of people ask me about my father, about what kind of father my man was. And I, well, I spent, but I spent six weeks with him on the road. It's like, that's not an answer to the question. Yeah. Like, I know I did not like the voiceover. I did not like the book and I don't like voiceover. Um, it's, there's only certain set times I enjoy it. 
And it's got to be real. Like, it's almost like got to be per. Oh, it's perfect. Like, you know what I mean? I just, right. I, I don't need it. I don't need it because then that tells me the ending. Uh, yeah. No. Hey, Field. Yes. I was just checking my wallet. It's empty. Let's fill it with some sponsor money. It doesn't come that quick. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> my rent's due tomorrow. <laughs> well, you don't have access to your pay- the PayPal account that way. Damn it. Do you experience digital eye strain from too much blue light exposure from digital screens? Baxter blue glasses are not your average frames. These blue light lenses filter 80% of the highest energy blue light, eliminating 99% of glare. The past year, we have all been glued to our devices more than ever. You know, I am, because I edit every single episode of Forgotten Cinema, all the little mid-roll things, all the two-player bros, sometimes crack them open. It's a lot. Our exposure to digital light has soared, and our eyes and our sleep are suffering as a result. Baxter Blue is also a force for good and provides a pair of reading glasses for someone in need for every pair sold. This is eyewear built for our digital age, and Baxter Blue is giving our listeners 10% off your next purchase of blue light, sleep, or kids' glasses. Click the link in our show notes for your exclusive discount. This is the sign you have been waiting for to invest in blue light glasses. We know you will love your Baxters, and we know that you will feel the difference. I think what I like in this movie is seeing Paul Newman acting, quite honestly. Paul Newman's, yeah, really good at yes. this. I mean, he's 72 when he did this movie. He'll pass away five years after this. Passed away at 83. At 83. Yes. Well, no, wait. Then he's not 72 in this he's movie. 78. Uh, he passed away 2008. So this movie was 2002. So six years later. So he was then he was in the, yeah, he was in his mid 70s. But he's... He's really good. I honestly, I don't really need to see that scene with him and Hanks at the end. That doesn't, you know what I mean? The stuff in the beginning, the stuff at the wake, the stuff, uh, you know, just kind of like during the, when he's yelling at Connor, like all that stuff is great. That yeah. stuff works for me. The scene where Nitty is trying to get him to kill the kid. Yeah. He's like, no. Yeah. I, I Not the kid. Stanley Tucci's really good in, in this. He's, Stanley, he's always good. Stanley Tucci, what I read about this is Stanley Tucci had always uh, rejected playing any kind of mobster because he didn't want to play any Italian stereotypes. He's Italian, yeah, because he's Italian himself, which um, is fine. And the only reason he did this is because he wanted to work with Sam Mendes. Right, right. No, yeah, and that, yeah, and he's. I mean, you've seen Nitty played so many different times, like, yeah, with so many different people. He's a historical he's just, figure. It's yeah. just him playing Nitty. It's not. You don't get that idea that you know, he's not doing some thick accent or anything like that. I kind of yeah. liked that. He's a very understated Nitty, though. He's not like he, he's like a businessman Nitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not. He's like a, which is funny because you don't. I mean, when you see Nitty. You have to think, okay, what time is it? Is Capone still in is Capone in jail? Or is is this when Nitty takes over? But like Capone, like this is the same year that at the end of the year they both get arrested. Right. This is they right before Nitty runs. Nitty it. gets out and then he starts running the, the outfit. But yeah, no, he's very business like in this. Yeah. Almost very like conciliary, like with Duvall's in uh Godfather. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of he's very understanding. Yeah. He's very reasonable. He's bi- yeah. He knows it's good business to have Connor killed. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Like that's you know, he has to convince Capone of that to give him up. Yeah. But I do like that. And yeah. like, he's just he's 17th floor. And the big guy just lets Tom Hanks up. He yeah. just goes in. I love that scene. Too, and, he, and, the, and he kicks. The, and I it, I just, what I picture, like he walks and then he walks out and he hits the door and the door opens up and you just see the mirror. Yeah. And you see the picture, you see Daniel Craig or uh, Connor dead. But I just picture the grip behind the door when Tom Hanks walks out and he's pushing the door. <laughs> like, 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 I just picture that. Like, that's what's happening. Like, he's, he's there with a big stick and he's like, okay, he's going to oh, go. And yeah. So, you know, that, that's done really well. Uh, back to Newman. So he was, he was nominated for best supporting actor and he lost. He didn't win. Yeah. I'm going to give you the nominees as I like to do. Okay. You tell me who won. You ready? Yeah. Chris Cooper for adaptation, Ed Harris for the hours, John C. Riley for Chicago, Christopher Walken for Catch Me If You Can. Was it Ed Harris? No. Ed Harris won for Pollock, I believe. Oh, okay. What was the first one then? Chris Cooper, Chris Cooper for Adaptation, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean. Adaptation's good. It is. It is. I think you I'm can. I, think, I like Christopher Walken and Catch Me If You Can, but. Paul Newman is really good in this movie, though. He at least deserved a nomination. Yeah. Uh, like, he, the when he's in the basement. And although that is a scene Chewy kind of like a, an Oscar bait kind of scene. Right. His his line at the end, it goes, then I will I will grieve or I will bury my son. And he's talking about burying Michael. Michael. Yeah, I'll bury the and son like, that, I, that I lost. I'll, I'll bury, bury the son that I lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like crying. I'm like, damn, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he's at the uh, at the very end, just that last the way he delivers that very last line after Michael's gunned down all his men in the street. Yes. And it's very filmic. It's very like of course it is. cinematic. Yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. But 
And Sam Mendes is one of those guys dying, apparently. Yeah, I read that, yeah. And he's just like, Tom Hanks is staring at Paul Newman, almost crying because he's about to kill his father. Mm -hmm. And Paul Newman's just looking. He's just so still at the handle of the door. Yeah. Looks him in the eyes and goes, I'm glad it was you. Yeah. And he shoots him. Then he just unloads into him. <laughs> You're right. So many bullets. You're right. Here comes 38 bullets. Oh, what? Jesus. I gotta finish the right, clip. You got him. You got him. All right. He's down. He's down. I can't bear to look at your face anymore. You have to blow and, it up off. Up and down. Up and down. <laughs> Michael. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna spell Sullivan. my name in you. Um, did you so did you see the note about Conrad Hall crying? So yes. he's setting up a shot with Newman and he starts crying because he was he was just kept saying he's so beautiful, he's so beautiful. This is his final film as well, obviously, before they both passed away. But um, I guess because Conrad Hall had shot him in other movies before, they've worked in Cool Luke and Butch yeah, Cassidy. Yeah. Since nineteen sixty seven. Right. So it was just, it was that's a that's a touching moment. That's yeah. a, that's you know pretty cool. And I just another thing about the look of the film, they tried to make the film look a lot like uh, the, the works of Edward Hopper for those out there who are, you know, big time art enthusiasts. So there was definitely thought processes behind, you know, certain shots and whatnot. Right. But with the look of the film, the one thing that I kept noticing was that it felt very, the outside felt very, dis, everything felt very desaturated and cold. Oh yeah. The outside stuff, some of the inside stuff like, but when they were like inside at the motel, uh, or the barn. It was warm. The mm -hmm. wake is very warm. Yep. Um, but everything else was just very cold and dark and just very like you just felt like, ugh, you know, like, oh, my God, this is not a, a, a nice environment. I, that's one of the reasons when I was telling at least we were watching this. It's so depressing. I'm like, it's not like super depressing. But looking back at like why she probably remembers it being depressing is it is very drab and very dour in terms of it is. the look. Yeah. It really just sucks the life out of everybody. This is a movie that you really need to be into film. I think you really need to be somebody who loves film, who loves. I mean, I, I mean, you I come you to it like the story. No, I mean, I think it I mean, I mean, $181 million worldwide. So obviously, but I think yeah. that you can really appreciate it more if you are into the people that are involved with the movie and into, you know, filmmaking and storytelling, because there's a lot of stuff going on into this movie behind the screen and behind the, right. behind the script as well. Uh, we, we, let's talk about the release date. So this is obviously a summer mail film because this is forgotten summer. Yep. And the release date was July 12th. Now I know you agree that that's, I don't think this is a summer film. The original release date for this movie was Christmas, 2001. Perfect release date. Exactly. And as Mendy's asked for it to be pushed because he wasn't ready. It's like, dude, you probably cost yourself a lot of rewards. Don't you think that this would have probably been received better? Like I said, with open range, the closer it is to award season, the more it's yeah. noticed. Uh, this is definitely a holiday film. This is not a July 12th film. This is not a middle of the summer film. Now, who wants to go watch this film in the middle of the summer? You but, want big escape movies. Well, that's the other thing. And we've talked about it before. It's also the setting of the movie. It's cold. Yeah. It's wintertime in this movie for most of the movie. Yeah. And regardless of what the movie's like, no one wants to watch a cold movie during the summer. No. Agreed. This is a movie that's. Christmas movie or the month of December mm -hmm. limited, maybe. Okay. I'll even say Thanksgiving. No, no. Cause what I was, okay. okay. But I was gonna say like, if it's Christmas, you know that it bleeds into January and February. So you're going to make all that money where no people just, anything else they're going to right, yep. want to go see road to perdition because, Oh, I heard this was good. Oh, it's out here. Let's go see it. This is definitely a holiday film. Absolutely. Holiday film. And I don't understand why. I mean, I, you're going to have to tell me. You're going to have to give me a reason why you put this out on July 12th. I, I just don't well, understand. It, it made delayed. money, but what's up? It was delayed. Yeah. So I'm sure the studio wasn't happy about it. Right. But they probably went, well, we got this opening. It's Sam Mendes coming right off of American Beauty. Boom. Yeah. Paul Newman. Boom. Tom Hanks. Boom. We're good. Maybe yeah. that's what they were like. And they're like, well, it's got action. We can cut the trailer a certain way. I, that's see to me that's them rationalizing and putting it out exactly i think that yeah. that's them trying to make the best of a bad situation right. they don't want to delay it in a whole other year i got point. you no that that i'm sure that maybe they had other stuff on the docket which was this is dream work so maybe they just had other stuff going on okay fine but honestly this is a christmas movie they should have just they should have been like no be ready which this was <laughs> almost not really almost a spielberg but he was considering this at one point he had read the script or read the it graphic been, novel yeah i don't know if it would have been i yeah. think it would have been better I think it's Spielberg. I think Spielberg, because of his experiences as a child, after you, especially after you watch the Spielberg documentary on HBO, right. watch it. Uh, <laughs> he handles family stuff better than like, I think anybody else. I think he and he knows how to direct Tom Hanks really well. I think he would have really done well with the father son dynamic. Um, 
Well, if let, he had a his own version, right? And let's also let's also remember this is Sam Mendes' second film out of American Beauty, so Sam Mendes is younger. Sam Mendes is new, so it, you know he's not going to be given that much leeway. Like Tom Hanks and, and Paul Newman are wonderful guys. I'm right. sure they weren't going to give him a hard time, but if they didn't want to do something, they probably weren't going to do it. But if Steven Spielberg's doing this movie and he tells Hanks, "No, this is what I want," and why Hanks, Hanks got to okay. give it to him, yeah, right? Because you know Hanks produced you know Band of Brothers and. You know, that's bloody. You know, it's not like he's against See, that's the violence. That's why I don't get like, yeah. oh, it's yeah. too much violence. What do you want from this movie? It's a it's a gangster film. It's a rated R gangster yeah. film. But you know it's going to be rated R. But that's the other thing. Maybe maybe if Spielberg does this, maybe it's not rated R. He might do a PG-13 movie. He might push the boundaries of PG-13, but he might not do it. Do an R film. That, mm, I, I, I understand. Like, he does, Munich's an R film. Okay, right. so I, I get it. So he, he's, I'm not saying he won't. I'm just saying maybe he wouldn't. You would agree with it because he push up the yeah. family aspect, maybe. Right, but I mean, it's really unfair, and this is going to come off very pretentious, and I apologize, but it's really <laughs> unfair for us to sit here and be like, "Oh, people will do this, people will do this," because I'm going to tell you right now, he's arguably the greatest director of all time. Right? No, he I, is. I don't disagree with you. I'm not saying you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm saying he, uh, and I'm, so, and he's you're going to get a whole bunch of people going, oh, "Good Tarantino." Yeah, that's fine. Tarantino's really good too, but Tarantino's only done ten films. Scorsese, 10, 10, 11 films. He's only done ten films at 10, this 10. point. Yeah. Spielberg, there's, uh, there are levels of how Spielberg films are not good as, you know, I know all, everyone always brings up always, I get it. Always isn't as good as other films, but it's not a bad film. You know what I mean? AI is, you know, everyone's like, oh, AI is mis- it's this, that, and the other thing. It's like it, but it's not a bad film. Yeah, so cool. I'm just saying, it's really tough to compare somebody to Spielberg because he would just do, uh, he would just knock it out of the park regardless because he always does. Right. And I know everyone's all up in arms because he did West Side Story, but. You know, why don't you watch it before you crap on it? Okay. No, I'm gonna crap on it now. I still like War Horse. Eat it. <laughs> <laughs> eat it. Uh, we haven't even talked about the kid, Tyler Hecklin, who's not a kid anymore because no. we're all old now. He's Superman and he's got teenage sons. But he won the part. <laughs> I know. He, oh, geez. He won the part after a nationwide casting call. Right. So that's how he got the role. They, they were like, we need a kid. Same age as me. I should have done the casting what were you, call. What were you thinking, man? You could have had two teenage boys. Wow, wait, hold on. He's, he's the same age as you? He's a couple months younger than me. And he has two teenage boys? Yes, in the show. Oh, okay. Hold on. I in thought the, you met in, in real life. No, I was no, like, no, holy the, crap. In the show, a Superman and Lois, he's the father of teenage oh, yeah, boys. Well, he's the same weird. age as me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> man, Superman doesn't age all that well. He ages, <laughs> I mean, he ages well. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching. I was like, holy, he's 33? He's supposed to be the father of two 18 year old, like 17 year old kids. Uh, so a couple of things uh, throughout at no point in this movie that I ever think like, well, I want to talk about the end. So at no point in this movie, everything Sullivan was going to win, get away with it. No, you, you watch the movie. Sullivan has to pay for his crimes. And he and he, in the in the, the scene that we keep talking about where we feel like it's pushed in there is when John tells him there's only one way that this ends for people like us going to hell. Right. Right. But dying. And that's what happens at the end. He gets shot and, you know, he gets killed at the end. And I guess it's a theme with Mendy's where he has water in a scene. When there's a death scene in any of his movies, yeah, water, water. whatever. <laughs> but so, you know, that happens and you have the whole ending where the kid can't kill McGuire. And right. The father does. And he, he, he knew he couldn't do it. And that was good. He was happy because it wasn't going to be like him and all that stuff. That was what he was afraid of. Right. The whole time. But my thinking is they're at Sarah's house, right? Yeah. So is Sarah dead? Oh, Sarah dead. So, oh, <laughs> she- so he, where are the, where are those bodies? A different room. Yeah. See, that's the thing. It's like I didn't need to see Sarah. Did you get? But the I want to know. I want to know that she's dead. Show me a leg. Show me you, like you know. You you know when he arrives with the dog to the um. But the dog's there. The older couple's house. Oh uh, oh that he that okay when uh, he goes there you know okay Sarah's got to be dead or else he will oh, stay okay. around Sarah. All right. I guess that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, I also like the fact that Jude Law's character is actually based on an actual crime scene photographer. Yes. Whose uh, nickname was Ouija, uh, which obviously is based on Ouija, Ouija boards. And he is a crime scene photographer in the 20s and 30s who was licensed to get a scanner, because I guess you need to be licensed to have a police scanner back then. And he got all to the police crimes and was allowed to go to the crime scenes and photograph bodies. And he was also allowed to sell them a lot like his character did. And some of the photos in Jude Law's apartment in the movie are those crime scene photographs. <laughs> Nice. So those are actual dead bodies on the on the walls. Awesome. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> gross, but good stuff. He's gross. His teeth, his teeth are gross. When he's pouring, I love the scene when he's pouring the sugar into the coffee at the diner. Oh, right. 
but it's just like more and more and there's the smallest coffee cup <laughs> he was like oh that's too much sugar bro and he just kept <laughs> going <laughs> um so i know you don't like accents or oh i love accents, accents. Oh, so did, you like, did you like did you like paul newman's accent he's doing an accent he is doing an accent and i like that he was working on doing an accent that was like a an affected Irish accent for an Irishman who had lived in the country for a long time. Was, and you know who, was, who helped him? Frank McCourt? I don't know who Frank McCourt is. He wrote Angel's Ashes. He owns the Dodgers. Oh, okay. So he sent Paul Newman a tape of him talking, and Paul Newman was, was trying to copy Working on that the yeah, whole time? Yeah, so. I like that. Jude Law does a very good accent in this. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Daniel Craig, not so much. <laughs> Daniel Craig slips up a couple times. I'm like, ah. <laughs> but Jude Law's accent, I was like, damn, that's... If I didn't know he wasn't English. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this movie is also considered number 10 of the top 10 movies, best movies made about Chicago, according to critics, awards, and RottenTomatoes.com. Oh, I saw this. Yes. Yeah. So, so <laughs> did you want me to go through the list? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so number one was the, the 1932 Scarface, I guess. Makes sense. It was based on a real guy who was in Chicago. Number two is Raisin in the Sun. Number three is Thief. Woo! <laughs> which is what, what movie we did number four is the dark knight which okay i mean it does it is should that that is the one movie where gotham city is it's chicago straight up okay like, they don't even hide it so it kind of makes but sense didn't they shoot in pittsburgh no i think maybe a couple scenes but this one was almost exclusively chicago okay whereas but, yeah. batman begins and uh dark knight rises. rises were kind of a mix of different cities okay Five is Hoop Dreams, which is a doc. So I don't know if that's what no, that know. counts. <laughs> Number six is the front page. Another one we did, Butler. But this the 1931 version. Boo! <laughs> Number seven is Chicago. I wonder why that's on the list. I know, right? <laughs> that's the, the, we're talking about the uh, musical one. Number eight is The Sting. Makes sense. Number nine is Ordinary People. That's pretty sad. And then number mm-hmm. 10 is Road of Perdition. So. so there you go. All right. All right. All right. So why do you think this movie was forgotten? All right. So as I kind of brought up at the beginning, what I was going, we we're going to save it to the end is when we started this podcast, it was for movies that not just maybe necessarily were forgotten. Maybe people don't know, but people don't talk about anymore that movies that are worth still talking about that aren't Star Wars or Marvel movies. And and I think this is a good example of movies that are still worth talking about, about bringing up again and talking about and talk about the performances, what didn't work, what did work and what people like about them. And yeah. I think that this is one of those that Tom Hanks has done so many movies and there are so many other movies that are kind of highbrow cinema, but with this kind of gangster movie take now, this is, this is a genre that kind of, I wouldn't say has exploded, but you know, since I would say like the late nineties and to today, there've been more movies like this that are more, that give you a little bit of that action, but, but like a, a, a artiste kind of cinema kind of vibe to it. Sure. And I think that this movie kind of is forgotten because it's just maybe like earlier on in that it's one of Sam Mendes earlier movies. It's Tom Hanks is a bad guy, which I'm sure people don't like talking about (laughs) because he's they like him being the good guy. Right. But I think this movie is still worth talking about Paul Newman's final performance. He's really good in this movie. Uh, And and I think that even though upon second viewing, we both have found some flaws in this movie that I think previously we thought was probably maybe more perfect than it actually was. Right. I still think it's a really good movie and it's still definitely something we're talking about. I mean, we've just talked about it for, you know, 50 some odd minutes. Right, so. right, right. I, I think that's why it's forgotten. Not so much that people don't know it. You know, I think most people have seen it who, who like film, but I don't know if it's talked about as much as some other movies that maybe this deserves more spotlight than it's given. Well, yeah. I mean, we say forgotten cinema. It's not that, you know, no. Oh, I never saw the movie. Like, It's not that you forgot about the movie altogether. Right. It's that you have forgotten to really talk about this movie with other people. So, you know, when you talk about Tom Hanks, this is not the first movie that pops into your head. Exactly. This is not the first movie that you talk about. And I know we catch crap online sometimes, but when we pick movies and they're like, it's not forgotten. It's like that's our concept of forgotten is is not necessarily the literal definition of forgotten. Of course. It's it's what I said. It's forgotten in terms of you forgot how to talk about it. You know, no, there's... there's... Lesser talked about movie podcast is not a good title. (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. So, yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. 100%. So, yeah. So, watch Road to Perdition again. It's on Paramount+. Plus. Oh, is it? Or did you watch it? I rented it like a idiot. It's on Paramount+. Oh, no. No. No, I watched it free on Amazon Prime. 
Oh, it is on Amazon Prime. I watched but, it on Amazon Prime. I rented Open Range the week before, but we recorded two in a row today. So yeah. Right, right. We don't let people know. Oh, people sorry. People behind the curtain. <laughs> Jeez. Pay no attention to what I rented when. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next week we are returning with a movie that I'm going to hate. Yes, you are. But your buddy loves it, which is why I so wanted to put this on the list. He ain't my buddy anymore. We barely talk. Damn. So, <laughs> uh, we are doing Call the Conqueror from uh, 1997. You are going to hate it. Uh, I am not going to like it either. Why did you pick it? Because it's so bad. God. It's going to be so bad. It's good. Dumb. All right. So that's next week. <laughs> Uh, we're going from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, That's good because we did two sublimes in a row. I, I can't have you liking all the movies we pick. I guess. You got to have your hatreds every other week. I guess that's true. Uh, <laughs> so that's next week. Call the Conqueror. I'm Mike Field. <laughs> I'm Mike Butler. This has been Forgotten Cinema, but we're doing Forgotten Summer this season. Hot tits. No. God, you suck. Hot tits.